So uh, welcome everyone to today's networking event with uh, Dr. Jennifer Hinstra. Uh, my name is Brooke. I'm a PhD student at McGill, a promote trainee, as well as the chair for the session. Uh, so this network event, networking event is um, organized by the Promote program. And for those of you who are not present at the talk and may not know what the program is, I will quickly give a brief introduction right now. So let me just share my screen. All right. So Promote is an NSERC uh, Create Funded Graduate student training program. It's composed of 11 uh, researchers and 52 trainees to date at six different Canadian universities that you can see right here. Um, there are four research themes that bring the PROMOTE team together. Uh, we have researchers and trainees from fields um, in sensing, diagnostics, and imaging, therapeutics, delivery, and biomaterials. And what differentiates this uh, uh, trainees in this program from other, our um, other graduate students is that uh, this program provides opportunities to uh, trainees uh, during the course of the program uh, where students are invited to participate in collaborative uh, training, do student exchanges and internships. We have uh, management and entrepreneurship courses and workshops. Um, the program also offers enriched academic training and helps us build leadership and professional skills that go beyond our training. And also one of the major focus of PROMOTE is to provide support network and mentorship for women in science. And uh, we have various workshop events, uh, mentoring events and networking events throughout the year. Uh, an example of a networking event is this one that uh, we're holding right now today. And so now I would uh, like to welcome Dr. Uh, Heemstra, maybe introduce yourself and share your uh, career journey with us. And then from there, I will start it off with uh, one question uh, myself, and then I'll open the floor for discussion with the audience. So uh, for the audience, please feel free to raise your hand or uh, send questions in the chat. Uh, so Dr. Heemstra, the floor is yours. So thank you so much, Brooke. Thanks to everyone for um, allowing me to join you today. I'm really looking forward to our discussion over the next hour. And um, I'd love for it to be a discussion too. So if you have thoughts on any of the questions, please uh, weigh in via the chat or raise your hand and, and, uh, and dive in. Um, so a little bit about me, I guess I shared a little bit during the last talk, but I became a chemist by accident. I was a uh, high schooler who, well, I found out I love science mostly because my eighth grade science teacher told me I was bad at science and that uh, through a series of coincidences uh, led me to Science Olympiad or as my parents probably would have told you, if you want me to do something, you should just tell me I'm bad at it and that I can't do it. And maybe in that moment, it was cemented that I would be a scientist, um, although I was bad at a lot of other things too. But yeah, so I, I became a scientist I went off to college thinking I wanted to go into genetics. I quickly realized that I did not want to do that. And I had no idea what I did want to do, but I had taken OCHEM over the summer after my freshman year. I had been so terrified of this horrible class I heard about, um, but then I actually had a blast. I didn't hate it. I loved it. And I had the opportunity to start working. Um, I needed a paying job. Um, I had a morning job. I needed an evening job. Um, so I started working in the chemistry stock room, like checking out the little glassware kits to the students who come to take labs. And at the same time, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I was supposed to do research. So I thought, well, I have no idea how to get into research because no one in my family had was a scientist and, and really no one had gone to college in any sort of an intentional way. Um, you know, my dad never went to college. My mom went to meet a husband and that was it. So I had no idea how to do this, um, but I thought, haha, checking out glassware for these labs. You know who's TAing those labs? Grad students. And I was like, oh, grad students are the coolest. I still think that. Um, but I thought, I know all of these grad students. Maybe one of them could help me find a way to get into a research lab. Um, and fortunately, that worked out. I, I looked around. I again said, what research just looks so cool? And it was research of James Nowick on these uh, foldable 
beta sheet mimics um, for reasons I will not under, ever understand, but I'm so eternally grateful for uh, James gave me a shot to work in his lab. So I was this undergrad who was like, well, I don't know what I want to do with my career, but I really liked organic chemistry. You know, I don't know science, you know, I don't know about research careers, but, uh, but he gave me a shot. And over time, I realized it took time. I said, hmm, I love what I'm doing, but it's not like what I want to do with my life. And then I realized like, oh no, I actually really, really love this. Um, maybe I'll get my degree in chemistry and then get a job and uh, go into industry. And thankfully James saw something in me that, that I didn't see in myself, which is just how much I loved research. And he often told me, you know, you should consider going to grad school. And I was like, nah, I'd never get in. I'd never make it through. And he was like, no, you should just apply. So I did. Um, was interested, as I kind of talked about in the Q&A, interested in a lot of things, but knew I wanted to do super molecular. I like had the word for it, like that's what I like. Um, and had seen Jeff Moore's research, got to meet him, realized what a phenomenal mentor he was. I also realized I love super molecular chemistry and I want to always have advisors who are phenomenal mentors and who really care about that. I uh, got both of those, went to grad school, had a blast. Um, also dealt with a lot of loss, um, lost my dad and my best friend in my last year. And so that introduced me to the world of coping with depression and mental health challenges because I didn't see that coming. Um, graduated, knew what I wanted to do, thought it was impossible. Also, my family expected me when I finally graduated to like stay home and have kids. Um, and then we found out maybe we never could have kids. So that Busted that all wide open, um, went through a series of hard conversations, soul searching, um, decided, you know, I, I, need to, I need to think about going forward. If academia is what I want, I, I was terrified of failure, but it was like, I need to get over my family's expectations of me. I need to get over my fear of failure. Um, set up a postdoc, obvious choice. I wanted a postdoc for David Liu. Thankfully, he had a spot for me. Um, went to my postdoc. Um, actually, very unexpectedly, uh, my husband and I welcomed our first child during the first year of our postdoc. We found out we were expecting the week we moved to Boston, which was a lot, but it was cool. Um, and I had, again, a great mentor who supported me through that. Um, more self-doubt, 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 self-doubt. Um, month before applications are due for faculty jobs, um, I was still stuck in the self-doubt. And... Now I had a baby, a toddler, um, and thankfully all of my advisors said, you know, you should, if this is what you want, just go for it. No guarantees, but just go for it. And I realized I'd rather live with failure than regret. And so I went for it. Uh, the tough part of that, so I talk about how people in my lab generate the ideas. That was, I like to pretend that's because I designed it. It was also a necessity because I decided to apply for jobs about a month before the applications were due and they require you to have these proposals, which back then were like seven pages each, right? Like three fully developed proposals. I was like, oh my gosh. So I dusted off the one from grad school that I wrote. It was like, I remember this being pretty good. I opened it up. I was like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Fixed it up, uh, came up with two more ideas. And I remember thinking, I don't think these are good enough that they're what I actually want to do, but I hope I can defend them well enough that people will see she's creative. This is out of the box. She'll come up with better ideas, but she's a creative person and we should give her a shot. And thankfully someone did. Um, University of Utah gave me a shot and um, went there, sat in my office on the first day of my job and thought, got this lab, empty lab down the hallway. Soon we'll be filled with people who are counting on me for their PhD or postdoc or undergrad research, what do we actually want to do? It's not really probably any of these things that I wrote these proposals for that we dabbled in those. Um, but then from day one, it's always just been the group driving the ideas. The answer was what I actually want to do is recruit fantastic people, give them tons of autonomy and an environment where we can all be creative and support each other and be our best, and then let the people drive the ideas. And that's what we've been doing all along, out of necessity at the beginning, and now because we find it a lot of fun. I also have, um, if you ever wonder about imposter syndrome, raging imposter syndrome for lots of reasons, um, but one of the biggest ones is I feel like 
everyone else who started their faculty job when I did had these plans and these proposals that they'd spent their whole postdoc developing or many years developing and it all built off of their previous research and they knew exactly what they were gonna do and they hit the ground running. And here was me who was like, I'm still massively changing fields. So not only do I have these ideas, I have no idea what we're gonna do. We're coming up with the ideas on the first day of the job. And a lot of it involves techniques that I've never done before. So I feel like every day for the last 11 years, I've just been trying to catch up and trying to catch up. Um, but maybe I'm hitting a point where I'm like, okay, maybe like things have equalized over time <laughs> and I'm not like so far behind of, of everyone else over time. And maybe we all kind of feel this way, but I, I always have to share that as well. So that's a little bit of... I guess my story of how I am here and um, yeah, along the way, realized how important all these leadership skills are. Yeah, I'll say that too. Got this job, hit me like a ton of bricks, like, oh my gosh, I um, was not trained for this job. Like this job involves conflict resolution and leadership and all of these financial management. And I've never got training in that. Um, but then I realized I can learn that stuff. And then I realized there's a lot of importance in sharing about that. And I also threw a lot of things that happened. Fast forward, not so great tenure vote, uh, which is like one of the worst things that can happen to you, but also dramatically changed the culture of our lab. And a lot of um, the things we do now and how we do things and the culture we have and the things that I care about and I talk about are really um, an outflow of that experience and the way that our lab all came together in that. And so, yeah, that's me having fun every day hanging out with amazing people. And the best part of my job is spending time with students and postdocs. And so getting to spend this hour with you is really, really fun. Thank you so much for that. I love how you are so passionate and excited about what you do. And I hope all of us can one day find ourselves in a position where we love what we do the same way that you do. So uh, you mentioned the idea of imposter syndrome. And one of the questions I had was how do you differentiate between imposter syndrome and actually being ill-suited for a position or a project? And how do you deal with setbacks or criticism because of such a situation? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, there's no easy answers to that. I will say, I think it's gotten tougher and tougher with each generation, because, you know, for me coming up, the idea of even a job, it was very utilitarian. Like you have a job, so you can make, make a paycheck, so you can live indoors and, you know, whatever, have food and a car and all of those things. Um, whereas now, and if you happen to like your job, that was like this bonus, but it was not really part of the equation. Whereas now there's this idea of finding what you're passionate about. And I think that can actually, something in your question is that that can actually drive sort of the worst imposter syndrome because now the bar is so high of this, I think society has created this narrative that you're supposed to find. There's this one career path that is your passion, that is the thing that you should do. And if you find it, you will be eternally happy. And if you don't find it, then you failed and you will be relegated to career misery forever, right? And, um, and I don't say that anyone here thinks that, but I think I hear that in just society in general. And I think that's a really unfair amount of pressure and can drive a lot of imposter syndrome because now that says, if you don't enjoy your job, you've somehow messed things up. And that's too high of a burden for any job. So I'd say this is more a career choice advice, but you know, I say every job has good and bad things to it. And a lot of it is thinking about you as a person, what are the, learn about the good and bad things for different jobs or different projects even, and think what are the good things that based on your personality and preferences are actually really important to you? What are the bad things that you find most tolerable? And run after those. And that's useful too, because then if you find yourself not enjoying it or just struggling at a time, it allows you to say, well, is this that I just need to like work differently or work harder, try to push through this to get advice? Or is it that this just isn't the right task for me? This isn't the right 
position for me. This isn't the right project for me. And so I think that can really help with a lot of that. I'll say there are tasks within this job. Um, and I've learned to see these where I'm like, Ooh, that is really ill suited to my personality. Um, if it doesn't, if it involves lots of spreadsheets and data, but not people and lots of rules and regulations and specifics, I'm going to do it horribly. And I just know that there's some of those I have to do. And then I just feel all incompetent for an hour while I'm in that meeting. And I know, okay, it's not, it's just. This just is what it is. My finance meetings with our fantastic grants corners. I'm going to feel not very smart for about an hour in that meeting and feel frustrated that I don't enjoy it. And I feel like I'm terrible at it. And I can't wait to like get back out the door, but then I can know, okay, that's just a part of my job. That's not suited to me. And I just need to get through it and I can make choices about what I decide to, to do or not do on some of the optional ones. Okay, great. Uh, so now I'll open it to everybody to ask questions. Please your, raise your hand or uh, type in the chat. Yes, Michaela. Uh, I just wanted to say again that a, a fantastic presentation, a fantastic talk. I saw, a, I was hearing a lot of things in your description of your path and the kind of things that your lab focused on and um, the kinds of things that uh, you're passionate about that were really resonating with me. And I, I, I'd mostly been referring to those as like structure function of, well, macromolecules, biomacromolecules, which is a bit of a mouthful. And I hadn't really thought of them as just being supramolecular chemistry because I've most, mostly thought of that as being um, networks of carbon rings or uh, metallochemistry <laughs> or... So would you say that that's what most people think when you say um, superchemistry or is it more of a uh, chemical biology direction these days? Gosh, oh, that is a really great question. I think it, you know, probably much like there's a lot of definitions of even what is chemical biology or not. I bet there's a lot of definitions of supermolecular chemistry. And you're right that especially going back to its roots um, and the Nobel Prize and things like that, we think of like crown ethers and rotaxanes and um you know, I said curcubiturals and, and all these different cavitans and things like that and not biomolecules. Actually, you're making me think of this. One, one time as an assistant professor, I was telling someone what I do. And I'm like, you know, it's super like your chemistry. And they're like, Jen, that's just biology. And I was like, way to ruin it. But I was like, well, biology is really freaking cool too. So fine, whatever, call it whatever you want. But I think that there is in the field there's definitely been a recognition for quite a few years um, that, that the biomolecules are part of that. So um, there's a great supermolecular conference uh, called F-Nano and there's, um, you know, kind of the organic super people and the bio people, um, but they all come together. Um, and actually now there's been uh, more and more kind of gatherings and conferences around specifically bio supermolecular chemistry. And I think the difference is whether you're using biomolecules. This is how I discriminate chemical biology from biochemistry too. It's like biochemistry is like, what does everything do when it's like doing what it's supposed to be doing? And chemical biology is how can we take advantage of all those properties to do something else that we want to do? And I think supermolecular chemistry is kind of similar. If you're, yes, the way our cells work is all supermolecular chemistry, but if you're trying to harness that and engineer it and use it for something else, then that's probably where it diverts from just biology being biology. Thank you. Wow. I'll have to, I'll have to look those I'll have to look those conferences up at some point. Thank you. All right, uh, Sandy. I think you had your hand up. All right. Yes, I did. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hemstra, for sharing your story. It was really nice uh, to listen to that. Um, my question has to do with uh, when you were applying for your acad uh, academia position. Uh, you had mentioned that you had to write these three proposals and the main thing that you wanted to highlight about yourself is that you were a creative person. Um, I was just wondering after uh, you heard that you had got the job, uh, was it due to the proposals or were there any other things on your CV, um, either like leadership skills or things that you were like a part of that helped 
do you get the job? Oh, fantastic question. Um, so the both kind of hopeful slash awesome and also challenging slash frustrating thing about academic jobs is that every department values different things. And that's good because otherwise, you know, 100 schools every year would try to hire the same one person. Um, but it's frustrating because what's going to go well at one school is not going to go well at other schools. And I, I think one of the things I kind of probably figured out early on or just did out of necessity is to be who you are. Because if you try and be someone you're not, it's still only some places are going to like that and some aren't. And then you aren't even ending up the place that wants the real you. So actually an example of that, my teaching statement, I have no idea how to write a teaching statement. Um, I sat down and like researched it and like Googled teaching statement and tried to write one. And I literally wanted to throw my computer out the window because I was so frustrated. Like I was having like a full blown tantrum because it was just so fresh. I couldn't write it. I couldn't write it all day. So frustrated. And then I just sat down and was like, forget all that. Like, I'm just going to write something that's genuinely me and my genuine like thoughts about teaching. And I you know, brought evidence-based practices into it. There's some you know, good and bad stuff to do, but it was very me. And I sent it to my PhD advisor and he said, well, some people are going to love this and some are going to hate it, but no one will say that it's not you. Um, and I was like, okay, I can live with that. Like, that's okay. So I think that my, my teaching statement definitely um, came through in some of my applications. I think, you know, papers, the, the role of papers in getting an academic job, I think gets overblown a little bit. Like, I think that, that the importance people put on that is not um, accurate to how most schools review applications, but they're certainly important. So I think people saw that I had done lots of different types of research. And again, some schools didn't like that, but some did. And they saw it as kind of a good versatility that could work in different areas. Um, I think a lot of it was, you know, communication skills, so valuable, you know, to, to be able to show up to a school and communicate your science with clarity, to tell a story, to engage an audience, help, you know, a person who's not even in your field understand what you do. Um, that's important. And I think, yeah, I think still the creativity. I didn't like come out and say like, I, I'm really creative, but I just showed like, okay, I'm going to do something a little different. And again, some schools want what's the safe bet where they look at and they go, oh yeah, this is an obvious next step is definitely going to work. But then I was fortunate that some schools said, wow, this is not safe. This is different from what a lot of other people are seeing or are, are doing and, and thinking this looks different than a lot of applications. And that's, that's interesting. And we want that. So I think those things are all important. Um, definitely the, um, you know, I'll say now being on the other side of it here, the leadership skills are really important. Commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion is tremendously important in our department now. So all of those things that are going to make someone be a fantastic mentor to their lab. Um, those things are really, really important to us because if you can mentor people well and be a good leader for your lab, then you're a lot more likely to be successful in your research. There are some people who are terrible mentors and somehow manage to do well at research, but I think that's actually more rare. More commonly you see when people don't have those leadership skills to cope with failure, to keep organized, to support people, um, then the research uh, kind of does not do well as a result. Great, thank you for your answer. Thank you for that question. Any more questions? If I could ask a follow-up, um, yeah. say you never got that position. With, with a PhD, what other types of jobs were you looking uh, to get? <laughs> Oh, I love that question, because um, this has also changed a lot. Um, yeah, if I'd never gotten it, gosh, there's a lot of things I could have been happy doing. I'd actually probably, you know, people often ask me, like, what would you do if you weren't a scientist even? I'd probably be an architect. I actually, like, realized that I really, really love architecture when I got to sit on building design committee. Um, you know, at the time, 
the options that were presented most commonly in grad school, you know, it's in grad school in the early, you know, 2000s, early aughts. I was like, well, are you going to do industry or academia, right? That was it. Um, so I thought for a long time, industry is what I wanted to do. And I went and did that actually for a couple of years between grad school and my postdoc. And I think I could have been really happy there. I happened to work at a company that was particularly, um, it was unfriendly towards its employees. Since we're being recorded, I'll put it very softly in that way. And so that made me realize that I didn't want to be there. If I had had a really, really good industry experience, I'd very likely still be there, actually. Um, and I'd probably be happy. I can look at, again, you know, I can look at industry and academia and, and see why I personally would be happier in academia, because to me, autonomy is like really, really important. I want to always do things. I could take you to my personality assessment and be like, oh yeah, right there. Autonomy. I want to do things different, even if they're not better <laughs> to a fault. Um, and people being able to mentor students and be part of that career journey and do things like have a lab retreat. All of that is really important to me. The grant writing part, not so fun, but I can tolerate it. Whereas some of the great things about industry, like making a discovery that could really, really change lives like next year, that drives a lot of people. It's really important to a lot of people. It's a great thing to see as important. But for me, that's less of a, a driving force. And, um, you know, for me, the, the not worrying about money, yeah, that'd be nice, but that's not a huge, huge benefit for me. So, you know, there's some of those things, but there's so much more you can do with a chemistry degree. Um, and I think this is a fun thing now. Of course, now there's more options. So it's more complicated. Um, but we've had people from our lab go and be science writers. Actually, I love writing. So maybe I'd be a writer. Um, we've had people go be science writers where they're like, oh, yes, I take all the stuff the scientists do. And I turn it into something that our customers can understand and appreciate and, and read. Um, we have people who are entrepreneurs. We have people who have gone to national labs. Um, there's people in the lab right now who want to uh, go into science policy or even law or work for NGOs. So there's there's lots of um, cool things that you can do. You know, we need scientists in government. You can run for office. Goodness, we need people, uh, scientists who are willing to willing to run for government office um, or be part of those teams and be providing advising. Great, thank another great answer, thank you. Thanks. Okay, we have hands up, Olivia. Yes, thank you. Um, that was a really great presentation and I really enjoyed Thanks. hearing your story too. Uh, I was wondering if you could go back and provide some advice to your past undergrad self or your grad student self, what would you say? Oh, oh that's such a tough question. Um, It probably would have been this realization that I came to about failure, that I lived for a long time being really, really afraid of failure. And when it boiled down, yes, yeah, so that's what I'll, I'm gonna give two. One is the failure thing, like it's, it's easier to live with regret than failure. And some failures are really big. I mean, I had to stare down like not getting tenure and the possibility of that. Um, but, and there's certainly some that are worse than that, but most failures are recoverable, but regret never goes away. And I think the other one is to not let other people define your goals for you. I was trying to live out what everyone in my life wanted me to do, which is get married and have kids, basically. And since I had failed, failed to do that as an undergrad, then I was like, it was like, well, okay, your second best option is to go to grad school. And so they saw. Um, but then once I met my spouse in grad school, it was like, well, obviously, once this PhD thing is done, like this is the path you're going to go on. And like actually the most off-brand gift I've ever gotten. <laughs> Hopefully the person who gave it to me, yeah, I bet this all being recorded, but the most like not me at all gift I've ever gotten was a subscription to Good Housekeeping Magazine. 
And it was right after we got engaged. And it was like, all right, well, now you're going to do like all this coupon clipping and recipe stuff. And like, that's great. I have so much respect for people who love to cook and love to bake and love to decorate their house. That's amazing. It's not me. It's not me at all. Like when my spouse has to work late, I like take the kids for takeout. It's, it's that, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't do that stuff. It's just not, not something I'm passionate about. And, but I tried so hard to be that person. I was trying, so, I was like, instead of watching football on Sundays, I was like copying recipes down. And I was like going and buying decorations for the house. And, and it just wasn't me. And I was so unhappy. And once, um, you know, I started my, my spouse and I started having a conversation where he was like, well, I didn't want you to be like that. I just want you to be you. And I was like, oh, I thought you wanted that. He was like, no. And I was like, well, I don't want it. He's like, I thought you wanted that. I was like, no. Um, and, and then we, um, yeah, we just, we both started being, you know, the people that we wanted to be. And that was, it's, yeah, extremely, extremely freeing and um, puts a lot of joy in your soul. It's hard enough to show up and be who we are. Trying to show up as someone we're not is really impossible. Thank you for that question. All right, Michaela. Um, I was wondering, in the last in the last 10 years or so, there's been a shift, well, especially in the last year or two with the fame of the um, mRNA vaccines. But there's been a shift in the last couple of years towards a focus on um, biotechnology, RNA therapeutics, just generally reaching, reach, really reaching its promise and its peak in, and I've been reading a lot about increased investment, increased interest. Have you seen an effect from that, like more funding available, different outlooks for your students, um, more interest from recruiters or collaboration? Ooh, good question. Yeah, RNA is like having a moment, right? And it is, it's pretty cool and really fun and, and long overdue. Um, I've definitely seen changes, especially in the industrial job market over the last year. And I think it's a bit more widespread than RNA, but I think it's, it's fueled a lot by that. I would, I am not an expert in this and I haven't studied it, but there is so much money, especially venture capital money, like flowing into biotech right now. And everyone is madly trying to hire and scoop people up as consultants and, and advisory board members and things like that. And, um, you know, I, I wonder if some of that isn't companies seeing how Moderna has done and thinking that they want to, you know, fund the next Moderna or whatever that is. And I, I probably reflects just an overall realization that um, biomedicine and, and healthcare research and biotechnology is um, much needed, also somewhat profitable. And it probably parallels things that have been happening in, um, say, the energy and materials landscape over the last 10 years as well, that that is also a very, very hot area for recruiting people into jobs. So yeah, we, we have seen that um, in that people are, um, you know, people have always gotten really great jobs coming out of our lab, but the urgency of the timelines on which industry is recruiting right now is much greater than usual. And so it's people saying like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm looking in six months and the company says, okay, well, we'll interview you now. And, you know, and then all of a sudden they're like, we want to hire you. Like, can you start next month? You know, and, and having to negotiate those conversations. So um, there's, yeah, there's a lot of interest, which is, I think it's, oh, you know, we've also had a moment that's shown public rejection of science as well, very upsettingly, especially here in the US, very upsettingly as a scientist uh, to see, see people rejecting science. Um, you know, thankfully you all have, have less of that, but um, so that's too bad. And it, it's really on us as scientists, you know, it, it means we need to up our game as scientists of building trust with the public and through really good science communication. Um, 
But at the same time, yeah, definitely science is, the importance of science is becoming really clear as well, especially RNA. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, great. Any more questions? While people are thinking, I have, uh, oh, actually, let's give Olivia a chance. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. I just had a follow question to my previous question. So you were mentioning how, you know, you love your job and you're focused on your job, but you also have your family and your home life. How do you find that balance between like work and, and your personal life? Ooh, that's a tough, it's a really great question. And it's a tough one. I would love to hear from other people here who are also navigating that balance. Um, some of the best advice I got on that comes from my former colleague at Utah, Melina Nakarni. And she said, our goal shouldn't be to find balance, but to avoid imbalance. And, you know, it's the idea that, um, it isn't like there's a magic number, you know, how many hours should I work a week? You know, obviously I can't like not work and spend all day with my kids. So I'd love to, but I also don't want to work all the time and never see my kids. What is the magic number? It's probably not 40 because that's arbitrary, but this idea that like, Oh, if we could just figure it out and be like, Oh, it's 48.32, right? Like that's, that's not going to happen. Um, and it's always changing. We can't always control it. And so I like to think of it, you know, her advice made me realize it's, if you've ever been on one of those like BOSU balls or wobble boards, right? You never, you're always moving and adjusting. And, and even if you do for a moment, find where you're balanced, then you flinch and it's gone again and you're back trying to adjust. And I think that that's how navigating um, work and life and hobbies and all of these things is. It's, you're always off balance in one way or another. You're always thinking, oh gosh, I want to spend more time with my family or, oh, I have this big deadline or um, whatever that is. But it's trying to at least keep, keep being off balance, but around that center that you want to have. Um, and so a lot of it is, you know, a lot of it is actually just having a partner who's supportive and then having, you know, if you choose to have a partner, choosing one who's supportive, and then having really open communication about like, okay, do you need me to take the kids to school today? No, really, I can do it. I'm happy, you know, okay, what do you have? What do I have? Who's going to step in and do this? Um, and okay, yeah, I could do this, but then I'll just need to like work through dinner tomorrow night. But okay, that's fine. We can do that. Um, and that's been really a key. And I think, you know, you'll always wish, no matter what you have in your life, you'll always wish you could put more time into everything, whether it's family or hobbies or friends your, or work. You always wish you could put more time into all of those things, but we have finite limits. And so I think it's trying to be as efficient as possible with work. Um, and then, yeah, just finding both a division of time that, that you're happy with over time. And also um, something I've come to appreciate is the level of integration too. It's like, um, yeah, well, okay, I love polymers too. So there's like mixed copolymers, which is just like all the different monomers together. And then there's black copolymers, which are like all this and all that. And our work-life integration, different preferences are like that too. Some people are like, oh yeah, I can work from home. My kids interrupt me, not a big deal. And then I go, you know, in the evening, I'm taking a work email during hanging out with my kids, not a big deal. Um, other people are very... There's some people who can't have photos of their family in their office, or they have to come home and change clothes before they say hi to their kids because they need that separation. And I think figuring out what type of person you are, and uh, I'll tell you the pandemic, I thought I was a work-life integrator and the pandemic showed me that I am not. Um, but I, I think figuring out what is your preference and then always, yeah, again, just reassessing that and saying, okay, well, I had this big deadline. I had to work more this week. But now when I didn't see my kids as much as I wanted, what is the time in the future that I'm gonna make sure I carve out to have more time with families so that I can, I can return and kind of keep that balance, you know, counterbalance it the other way so that it's still kind of centered where I want it. That's a great question and a great answer. Um, 
you said that you wanted us to share. And for me personally, um, I find that not feeling guilty about taking a break is an important aspect because the the days and the hours that I actually work after taking a break are that much more productive than if I tried to force myself to always work, you know, and also having separate space for work and life also also uh, helps in, in that process as well. So that's interesting. Is there anybody who would like to share any tips, tricks? Uh, I mean, I can't say it. I honestly can't say a ton on the work-life separation, if only because the main thing I have, if only because I'm, I guess, I guess I'm mostly an integrator, mostly because my partner is long distance. So ultimately there isn't really materially much of a difference if I'm messaging them during a 15 minute break at work versus messaging them after I've gone home for the night. But um, I, I will say I felt a lot more productive, a lot more, not even just time spent in the lab doing things, a lot more creative and able to see the problem and able to see, hey, there's a problem here. How can I fix it? Sit when I've made sure that I have that time for myself and for them and doing whatever random things, even if they don't seem important because they're important to me and to my mental health. All right, thank you for sharing. I have one question um, that I'm curious about. So from your talk, you really emphasized how a lot of ideas from uh, your students, uh, I mean, a lot of ideas in your lab come from your students, uh, which is great, but it's also not easy for us students, especially moving from undergraduate to graduate uh, studies, where in undergrad, you're always told what to do. And then in graduate, you're given a lot more independence. So um, what advice do you have uh, for students in terms of fostering that independent thinking and, you know, taking a proactive role in shaping um, your research, basically? Oh, thank you for that question. I love that. Um, yeah, I'll say a couple of things um, that can be helpful. One is this idea, we get this idea that independent means going it alone, right? It's like not asking for help. Um, but really independent means taking more ownership. So it doesn't mean changing the extent to which you interact with people for advice, but it change, means changing how you interact with other people for advice. That as an undergrad, you might go to a grad student you work with or a PI and say, my experiment didn't work, what should I try next? Whereas as you move towards independence as a grad student, when something's not working, you should absolutely still be seeking out help, but it's maybe the difference of being the one to recognize you need to seek out help and then also owning that process. It's going to someone and saying, I got these strange data. Here's a few things that I think might be going wrong or here's something I'm thinking of trying to troubleshoot it. What do you think? What else could be going wrong here? What else might I try? But you're owning the process of, of initiating at least that conversation and initiating the, okay, I've thought through it. Here's what I think is happening. Now, what do you think? Um, and you can definitely still as a grad student be like, I got nothing. Like this has failed 22 times. <laughs> I got nothing, someone just tell me. Um, that is still very much allowed as well. I don't want anyone to think that, that that's not okay. But I think that's a big part of the independence. And I think the, the other part of it is, it's a professional development thing that I, you know, in, in thinking about research ideas specifically, all of these things are professional development things actually. You know, project management is a professional development skill. How do you look at a whole project see what could be a first paper, see what could be the core feasibility experiments, and then think about the most strategic order in which to do those experiments. What thing are you gonna kind of wing it a little bit and say, well, if that doesn't go well, I'll have to backtrack, but it would take so long to check in on it at every step. Um, what things do you say, no, I'm really gonna stop and make sure this is working before I move on. How do you manage your time with things that you have to 
you know, like sequencing where you, you know you're going to do some stuff, throw it over the fence for a couple of weeks before it comes back to you. Um, all of that is our skills that, that you can pick up and, and learn over time. And generating research ideas is the same. That I used to think ideas were like this magical lightning bolt strike of creativity, but really it's a process. And that's one of the things we put a lot of it's been fun to do this, it's been so challenging for me, but also really fun to say, okay, we're going to have people driving the ideas and writing grants. How do we put professional development behind this? And how do we put mentoring behind this? And how do we have it be a process that you walk through, you know, and, and you get better and better at as you're go through your graduate career or postdoc career? And um, it was really challenging because generating ideas, I been doing this work for so long. Now, you know, 20 years since I started working, oh, 20, 20 years since I started grad school, 23 since I started as an undergrad, you just kind of know, you see an idea and you're, or you generate these ideas and you're like, oh, that's good. That has promise. That's terrible. Yes, no, yes, no. Is it going through my head as I'm reading a paper? But to walk it back and say, well, what's behind that? Um, and it's things, they're, they're templates for generating ideas. It's saying, well, what can the system do? What can it not do? Could we solve that using a different method? Or could I take this method and this method and combine them? Or could I take this method and apply it to this problem over here? So there's all these scaffolds as you read papers, listen to talks, where you can kind of generate. So we do this little exercise, actually one of the class, classes I teach where I'm like, spend five minutes reading your two papers each, and then think of a combined idea you would do. It doesn't matter if it's terrible, just like get, get the ball rolling. And then we have questions, we ask our ideas. And if you can literally go through and answer these like seven questions, and you're still excited about what you're going to do, then it's probably a pretty reasonable idea. Um, and then to, to just, just realizing that over time, um, all of the ideas get better over time. They always start out. Actually, a great book about this. I highly recommend this. Uh, is Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull. And it's the story of Pixar. And there's a shockingly high resemblance between how we design projects and create them and make them happen and how they create a storyline and make a movie. And um, I, I used to just think, oh, a bunch of brilliant people get together, they generate the storyline and then they like animate it, right? And it's like, no. And he talks all about failure and all about all these things that fail. And he has a great quote that he says, all of our movies are terrible at first. And our goal is to go from suck to not suck. And so I think about that with projects. Our goal is to take not great and turn it into something that's pretty great. But all of the ideas are pretty terrible at the start. But then as you do more and more, they get better. Oh, and thank you for dropping the link there. If anybody's interested. Um, so we have a question from Connor. I don't know, if, uh, Connor, if your question was answered already, you can unmute yourself. Uh, but his question is kind of, uh, so sorry. What's the best way to come up with new research ideas as a professor when a research project has ended or has failed? What advice could you give to graduate students who are stuck thinking of new ideas? You that's gave a, a good answer that's similar to the question. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I guess maybe something I'll just add on top is, um, you know, generating ideas, it's, it's a skill and it's a good one to be just practicing all the time of, you know, every time you sit in a seminar or read a paper, just be like, I'm gonna generate three ideas from this. And even if they're terrible, you know, Adam Grant tells us, if you wanna have good ideas, you gotta have a lot of ideas because most of your ideas are gonna be terrible ideas, at least mine, 99.999% of my ideas are terrible. And so I think just always thinking about things and always having um, in as much as you can kind of developing that backup plan of this doesn't go well, um, what could I do instead? Um, I have not always followed that advice. I have been in those situations a few times and they're, they're tough, but, um, but ideally kind of thinking a little bit ahead can, something I wish, that's advice to my former self. I wish I would have done more of that. It's definitely a skill that we just need to keep practicing until you know we get good at it. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? We have about nine more minutes. 
I'm trying to get better at the awkward silences. I feel like we should have a bit of that to stimulate conversation. So <laughs> I'll wait until somebody has a question. I have a question. Um, so something great about the promote program that most of us are a part of is the ability to go through, uh, ment uh, to have a mentor and mentor us uh, throughout our program. I was wondering how important of a role did mentorship play uh, in your success? And um, like, other than your supervisor as a mentor, did you go out and seek other type of mentorship? that question mentorship played a huge role basically I'm here because I had great mentors who at every step helped me see what was possible and encouraged me to do it and helped me when big roadblocks came up you know I've had some really pretty like potentially career-ending things that have happened and in each of those, one of my mentors was there to say, okay, we're going to get through this. Like, this, this is awful. It really stinks that this happened, but let's talk about how we help you get through this. And, you know, said, like, how do you want to navigate this and help me figure out what I wanted to do? And then in very tangible ways supported me through those moments. So I'd say mentors, hugely, hugely important. Um, something I didn't do enough of but I wish I had done more of is to cultivate exactly what you said, Sandy, is to cultivate mentors beyond your advisors. I have that now, but I should have had more of that earlier in my career. And I wish I would have. In fact, kind of funny, one of the members, even though I didn't work with nucleic acids or biomolecules at all as a grad student, I had um, Steve Zimmerman as one of my thesis committee members. And I was terrified terrified of him when I was a grad student, even the department chair, and it's just so quiet. And, but now he's a great friend and a wonderful mentor. And whenever we see each other, you know, we spend time together, we talk, but he also, and he also gives me a lot of great advice. So I'd say, you know, definitely cultivating that village and also realizing that the further you go in your career, the more diverse of a set of mentors you need. So in grad school, I mostly needed mentors around the research itself or career options, things like that. Um, but now that I'm in this faculty job, I realize, oh my gosh, and I need leadership skills. So I need leadership mentors. So I have some mentors who aren't in science. Some of them aren't even in academia. They're in the private sector, but they are really good at organizational leadership. And they mentor me in different ways around those things that I need to learn. Or if you want to go into entrepreneurship, you need business people as, as mentors. Oh, and I see the follow-up question. I can dive into that one if you want. How do you find mentors outside of your immediate area of research? Um, if they're still within science, um, going to conferences can be really good. I'll say social media is a great way to find mentors, but also if they're people whose career paths you aspire to or you're just curious about, I think finding people on social media or LinkedIn or talking to the mentors you have, this is a great thing about a network. You can talk to people in your network and say, hey, do you know anyone who does this sort of thing who I could talk to? So I'm often sending people, connecting people to other people I know who can talk to them about policy or communication or writing or whatever that is. And then I found, I actually still do this. We talked about networking and mentoring in my lab. And then I put myself on the hook to actually follow the homework um, is to reach out to those people and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. Some of these were people I knew, but say, I really admire your career path. And I aspire to similar things. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk with me for a half an hour about how you got where you are and any advice you have for someone in my position. And not everyone will say yes, but most people will. And people really enjoy talking about what they do and how they got there and their story. People love giving advice. Most people 
want to do something positive. They want to be helpful. They want to interact with other great people and, and meet people. And so that's been a, a that we've gotten a lot of mileage out of doing that. And you learn some really interesting stuff. And then you've met someone who may well just become a really great champion for your career too, because now they've invested in you. So they're more likely if they see a cool opportunity to, to, you know, pass it your way. All right. Uh, thank you so much. We are sadly approaching the end of this amazing networking session. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Heemstra for um, joining us today, giving us your time. I'm sure you're very tired. Um, I've learned a great deal from this. 